morning, welcome to morning worship. And again, a special welcome to Adam at the start of his ministry with us. Our service this morning follows the form of recent weeks. This week, the government announced further guidance for the control of coronavirus. The statements were broad and lacking in detail. This week, we should receive from the denominations the exact details of what they mean for churches. Churches and worship, two different words and with different connotations. If there are significant changes, we will inform you and organise our service accordingly. It remains the same then, if you wish to attend next week's service, you must let me know by Wednesday evening. After that, if you can let Sylvia know. And do keep to the regulations before, during and after services. Adam's reception service will take place on a Saturday afternoon, the 26th of September. Sadly, but obviously, seating will be limited and a draw will inevitably be required for places. So again, please let me know this week if you wish to attend. Alternatively, again, tell Sylvia. Finally, I do have an old-fashioned uh, uh, notice from Margaret Ireland. Quay will take place on Friday at 2.30pm unless government guidance changes. Attendance will be limited to six. Please tell Margaret if you wish to attend. But the ladies' fellowship remains postponed. Oh yes, it's Richard's birthday today, so quick wave, but you know, no touching and feeling and all the rest. <laughs> A moment of silence and we will commence our service. Good morning. morning. It's so wonderful to see everyone this morning, or at least to see you from from here up. I want to begin begin before we start our worship by thanking everyone uh, that has made us feel so welcome these first few weeks here in Godalming. Uh, Thank you for the cards, the gifts, the the food, uh, the cakes, all the things that have been dropped off or mailed to the manse. As you can imagine, starting a ministry in the midst of a pandemic like this is not uh, easy, but but you guys have done a wonderful job of making us feel as if we are already part of the Godalming community, and we look forward to to getting to know you better, uh, maybe a little more slowly than I would have liked, but definitely get to know you all over the, the weeks and months to come. We're going to begin our worship service this morning with a classic hymn. Again, I have to ask no singing, but you are welcome to to hum along or to mouth the words or to just to enjoy them as as they play as we hear our first hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let's pray. Holy God, we sing your songs of praise this morning, even if we can only sing them in our hearts. We know that when we gather together to worship, whether it be here in this building or through the online services, we know that whenever we gather that you are here with us. Help continue to build us into a faithful community, Lord. A community that cares for one another. A community that listens to one another in love. As we spend our time in worship and praise here today, Help us to recharge our spiritual batteries. To be ready for whatever trials and temptations the week ahead may find. Lord, I thank you for this church. We thank you for their love, for their witness, for their welcome here in this community. I just pray that you would continue to guide us through this time of, of pandemic as we are, are ministering in new ways and adapting to new rules and regulations. To bring us out the other side, a church that is still strong, a church that is still faithful. A church that is ready to do your will and answer your call, whatever that may be. Lord, we come this morning to give our offerings. Whether we have given here in person, or we have given through other means. Lord, I just pray that you would bless these gifts that have been given. Use them to strengthen in the ministries of this church as it reaches out to the town around us. Use it to spread your word and your will throughout this country and through missionaries around the world. Bless it and us today, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. reading this morning is from the start of the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 6. The Lord commands Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm going to give to them, to the Israelites. It will give you every place where you can set your foot. And I promise Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people 
to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Amen. Back in the 90s, there was a, a TV show on the CBS station back in the States. I don't know if it ever made it over here, but it was a show called Early Edition. And the show was about a, a man named Gary who one morning went out to get his morning newspaper. And when he picked it up and glanced at the top, he saw that it had the previous, or excuse me, the next day's date on it. It had tomorrow's date on the top of the newspaper. And first, he thought this was simply a misprint, but as he read through the paper, he began to see events that he didn't recognize, things that, that hadn't happened. But then over the course of the day, the predictions made in that newspaper came true. And the premise of the show was that every morning when Gary went out to get his paper, it was the early edition, it was tomorrow's edition of the paper. And so he was getting a glimpse of the future 24 hours in advance. The series was about him coming to terms with this responsibility that he had been given. Deciding how he was going to use this knowledge that he had. And eventually going on to trying to save people. Trying to prevent the bad news from happening and trying to make the world a better place. Now I love fiction like this because I love this idea, like many people, I love this idea of wondering what the future holds, of wishing we could know what the future holds. I know the past six months in particular have been a time where we want to know what tomorrow or the next day will bring. And so this television series made, made us ask questions of ourselves, such as what would we do if we were in Gary's shoes? What would we do if we had early knowledge of what was going to happen tomorrow? If you walked out on your steps and found tomorrow's newspaper sitting there, what would be the first section that you would turn to? Would it be the financial page to see what the stocks were going to do tomorrow? To know when to buy or sell in order to, to make yourself rich or at least comfortable? Would you use it to help those in need? If you knew that someone was going to be in trouble and needed help, would you rush to save them? Would you become a kind of hero. If you knew from the obituaries where someone was going to die, would you be there to prevent that from happening? What would you do? What would I do if 
we knew what was going to happen tomorrow. There are many people that take this question to the extreme, that are obsessed with knowing the future, of learning the future. From reading our horoscopes, trying to find our future in the stars, to trying to make a timeline out of the book of Revelation. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what is going to happen next in our world. And this is not new. The scripture talks many times about the futility of knowing the future. Solomon, going all the way back to the book of Ecclesiastes, says, no man know, since no man knows the future, who can possibly tell him what is to come? Since our life on this earth, since our days here are uncertain, we can't really know what the future will bring. And if we can't know what the future will bring, how do we face that future? What do we do? How do we prepare ourselves to live lives continually facing the unknown? This morning we're going to look at one of the patriarchs, one of the heroes of the faith in Joshua and the scripture that, that Alan read for us this morning. And we're going to see someone who was facing a very tumultuous time in his own life, his own leadership, and his own ministry. And we're going to see what he did and the advice that he was given and how we can apply that to our own lives as well. First of all, we're going to set the scene. This is, is sometime after God had freed the slaves from Egypt. They had gone out, they had parted the, the Red Sea, they had wandered out into the wilderness, they had come to the very gates of the Promised Land. But when they arrived there, the scouting party that they had sent forward to see what the Promised Land was like was overwhelmed by what they saw in that land that God had promised them. Fortified cities, huge armies, giants of people defending the land. And they came back to Moses, they came back to Joshua, they came back to the people and they said, there is no way that we can conquer this land. It cannot be done. We are better off going back to Egypt, we are better off going back into slavery, we are better off dying as slaves than dying here in the promised land. And because of their lack of faith, because of their disobedience, the Hebrew people were then sent out in the wilderness to wonder for what we are told was 40 years. 40 years, which in Hebrew terms meant a generation. You see, all of that generation that had complained, that had whined, all that generation that had faltered in their faith, that generation had to pass away before they would be able to enter the promised land. And here we are, 40 years later, and the last of that generation was Moses himself. And Moses knew that he was going to have to die, that he was going to have to pass away himself before the Hebrew people could claim their inheritance and their birthright. And finally, that day has come. Moses is dead, and the Hebrews are camping on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And they're looking across into this land that they have been told is the promised land for them. A land that is flowing with milk and honey. A land where they will be safe and be able to inhabit. A land where their descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Now Joshua is, is no dummy. Joshua has once again been sending out spies. He's been sending out people to take a look and he, they've come back and he's to been told that there are at least seven enemy nations that are occupying this promised land. 
strong nations with trained armies and fortified cities. Nations that are far better equipped, that are far more experienced than Joshua's young army of wanderers. And so Joshua is looking at once again the obstacle that drove people away 40 years before. And he's looking at the fact that Moses, Moses himself, the hero of their faith, Moses himself was not able to lead the people into the promised land. And now he is being asked to do what his hero, what his mentor, could not. We can only imagine Joshua's fear, his trepidation as he stood that day on the banks of the Jordan River. But we're told that as he stood there, that God gave a message to Joshua. And it's that message that we are going to look at both for Joshua and for ourselves this morning. Because the first part of the message that God gives to Joshua is that Joshua has to first let go of his past. Verse 2, the beginning of God's message, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now when I first read this, I had to ask the question, did Joshua really need God to tell him that here in the first sentence? After all, Joshua was the one who was stepping into Moses' sandals. He was the one that was going to have to live up to this reputation. He was the one that was going to have to do what Moses could not. I'm pretty sure that Joshua was very much aware that Moses was dead in this moment. After all, that's where his troubles, that's where his anxieties had all began. And so Joshua is facing this fear, he's facing this trepidation, looking at what he is supposed to do, knowing that, that he has been given a task that Moses could not complete. And it goes on, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give him. When, Moses, or when God is telling Joshua that Moses is dead, he's not saying it to inform Joshua of a fact that he doesn't already know. Instead, he's giving him reassurance. Joshua, listen to me, God is saying. Moses is dead, but you are not, and more importantly, I am not. I have a plan for your life. I have a plan for your people. I have a plan for your nation. But we need to get on with that plan. At this moment, staring across the Jordan River, Joshua is very much stuck in the past. A past where Moses was the leader. A past where Moses made the decisions. A past where Joshua was simply the lieutenant. Or the captain who followed the orders of, of those above him. If he is going to cross that Jordan River, if he is going to lead the people into victory, he is going to have to first let go of that past and accept the fact that God is not now counting on Moses but it's counting on him. I suspect that there are many people here that need to let go of some piece of their past. Maybe there's something you've done in your life that you're not proud of. Maybe some secret sin or shame that, that you wish you could forget about. Maybe it's comparing ourselves like Joshua did to a mentor or a hero and telling ourselves that we'll never live up to our father, or our grandfather, our mother, our grandmother. Maybe our problem is that our past has been too blessed, too fortunate, making us think that, that nothing bad can ever happen to us. But whatever it is that's distracting you, whatever it is that's holding you back, whatever piece of your past 
you cannot let go of. If we are to be the people that God has called us to be, to live the plan that God has called us to live, we have to trust in Him that our past has been forgiven, that our sins have been wiped away, that it's up to us to live the lives that He has called us to live. The first piece of advice for Joshua is that he has to let go of the past. The second thing that God tells Joshua is that he is not to become sidetracked. Verse 7 says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses has given you. Do not turn from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you may go. Now, I don't know about you, but I find getting sidetracked to be very, very easy. I don't know if it's a lack of attention span. I don't know if it's, it's growing up in a, a world that's moving quicker and uh, is filled with mass media. But it's easy for us to, to get sidetracked. It's easy for us to get distracted and led off somewhere that God didn't intend for us to go. And those sidetracks can also, all too often, be good things. Maybe it's a promotion in your job. Suddenly you don't have time to come to church, to read your Bible, or to pray like you used to. Maybe it's a hobby that you have fallen so in love with, that you've gotten so caught up in, that you no longer have time for God. Maybe it's a, a new relationship where you're spending so much time with that person that you have no time left over for God. But the scripture goes on in verse 8. God says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful and do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. He tells Joshua that Joshua should meditate upon the law. That Joshua should meditate upon the word. In our modern terms, that he should meditate upon the scripture. That he should think about the blessings that God has given his people. The responsibilities that he has asked them to live up to. And once he has accepted these responsibilities, once he has been thankful for these blessings, then and only then will he be able to do something with them. As I said, it's so easy to get sidetracked by life. But we need to remember all that God has done for us. I'm sure, I hope anyway, that all of you here can name at least one way in which God has blessed your life. Hopefully you can name many ways in which God has blessed your life. But I know that if you're like me, in the past six months, maybe it's been kind of hard to name those blessings. It's been hard to think of those blessings. We find ourselves overwhelmed by our anxiety, our fear, even our sadness of what's happening in the world around us. But God is telling us that we cannot get sidetracked. We cannot get sidetracked by fear. We cannot get sidetracked by hobbies. We cannot get sidetracked by even good things in our lives. But in all those things, we should be thankful to Him who gave them to us and ready to live out the call and the responsibility that comes along with them. The third thing, the final thing that God told Joshua to do was to step out in faith. Now, when we're talking about stepping out in faith, we need to understand that faith is a word that is very much like love. And that faith is not a passive word, but faith is an active word. Faith is an action word. Our faith is never passive. Our faith is never something that we simply allow to exist. 
It's not enough for us to simply sit around and say that faith is what I believe. Because that is not faith. Faith is not simply what we believe, but it's how we live. It's how we act. It's how we go about each and every day of our lives. I can say that I have faith that airplane is a safe way to travel. But until I'm willing to, to put myself on that plane, I'm not showing that faith. Faith is believing and showing that you are willing to put your, your money where your mouth is, so to speak. When we moved to this country about a year and a half ago, uh, our entire house was, was filled and furnished by what you call flat pack furniture. You guys know what this is. This is Ikea stuff, right? You know, they managed to fit a bed into a box this size, and you have to put it together. Now, I'm a firm believer, and my wife put this on Facebook this morning uh, in response to a, a friend's post, but I am, I am a firm believer that at least 50% of divorces start with one partner saying, hey, let's put together that Ikea furniture real quick. <laughs> we struggled, we argued, we skinned our, our knuckles, but we got that furniture together, and it looked pretty nice. But then came the test to see whether that bed we had put together was going to hold the weight of the person sleeping in it. And I had faith that it would hold Lizzie, so I made Lizzie get into the bed to, to test it out. But honestly, that's not faith, is it? Until you're willing to put yourself on the line. And until I was willing to put my backside into that bed and see whether it was going to hold me or dump me on the floor, I really had no faith in my own ability to put together that furniture. Faith is not just about talking. Faith is not just about believing. Faith is about acting and showing what we believe, what we have faith in, and what we trust. Faith is trusting in God to fulfill His promises. Now, God made no promise to me that I was going to put that flat pack to get furniture together well. But God does promise us that He has a plan for our lives. God promises us that He is with us each and every day of our lives. And God is promising us that He walks with us even during the most difficult points in our lives. Joshua and the people of Israel were safe and cozy on that eastern bank of the Jordan River. But until they crossed it, until they entered that place of danger and uncertainty, they were not doing what God had called them to do. There's one more other point about Joshua's entry into the Promised Land that I want to, to bring up this morning. As we move further along as we, in the book, as we get to, jer, to chapter 3, we finally get to the point where Joshua and the people are actually crossing the river and entering into the, the promised land. Now, when we picture Joshua and the Hebrews crossing that river, we kind of get our idea, uh, this idea in our mind kind of like the Ten Commandments, right? Either we read in the book of Exodus or we've seen in the movie where Moses goes out and he lifts up his hands and, and the waters part and they pile up on each side and it's a dry corridor all the way through for the people to, to pass through. But we're actually told in the book of Joshua chapter 3 that their crossing of the river was very different to that. It says that when the priests, who were to go first, when the priests first stepped foot in the water, it says that the river stopped running way upstream. Now, if this is the Jordan River, and it's, it's flowing down toward the, the, the narthex out there, and the water stops here, what happens to all the water on this side of the dam? It keeps going, right? It keeps flowing. And we're told that as the Hebrews walked out into the water, Water they told that God was going to help them cross. The river that they were told God was going to part for them. As they took those first steps, the water didn't go anywhere. That water that had been backed up was still coming downstream. And so they were, as they were walking out, the water was getting deeper 
and deeper. And they were being called upon to show faith that God was going to fill his promises. The point of this is that the first steps in faith are always the hardest. Even though God had already done His thing, He expects us to keep stepping out on faith, even as the water of our lives grows deeper and deeper around us. God has already stopped the river. God has already dammed the water. Soon enough, we will be on dry ground. But in the meantime, we are asked, how much faith do we have to keep going when the water is still rising? How much faith do we have? The Apostle Paul said, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can master every circumstance that comes my way if my faith and my trust is solid in Jesus Christ. That is how we are to face the future. Life is filled with ifs. Life is filled with uncertainties. But we can face the future, even not knowing what it, can, what it holds, as long as we put our faith and our trust in Jesus if we seek our, His plan for our lives, and if we are willing to step out in faith and do what is pleasing to Him. Would you join us now for our time of prayer? Our God is always ready to listen. Let us pray to him now. We pray for our world's troubles, the destruction of the migrants' camp in Lesbos, the loss of life and property in Oregon due to wildfires. Lord of life, we lay before you now those struggling with pain and anguish or wrestling with tragedy and conflict. We stand beside them in their suffering and offer it to your healing love. We have so much on our hearts at this difficult time. So many people affected by the pandemic. Those with chronic health conditions, the elderly not able to see family, especially in care homes and hospitals. May your love and strength reach out to them in the way strangers have delivered shopping, collected medication, cooked meals, and tried to help in so many ways. We pray for the homeless who have returned to our streets, the migrants making their lives, risking their lives to find sanctuary and a new life. And we pray for our police force facing hostility, trying to break up large groups, demonstrations and knife crime. Dear Lord, be with the bereaved, especially Nicola's family at this sad time. The lonely, sad and anxious, whose problems are exacerbated at this time. Be with us all. May we feel your love and grace extended to all. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now I invite you to join along again in listening to our final hymn, Lord, you call us to your service. As we leave this place this morning, I invite you to step out in faith and love. Into faith that you are living the life that God has called you to live, and the love that God has called you to show to each other and to the entire world. Go today with that faith and that love guiding all that you do. And all of God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.